Hello, today is Wednesday, July 22nd, uh, 2020. My name is Jackie Pelota. I'm here interviewing Jose Miranda for the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know that this interview will be placed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American collection at the University of Texas at Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. Because we're not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting. So I'll ask you a series of five questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each one. There are two questions though that we need to make sure you agree to before we go on. Voces wishes to archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation at the Benson Library at UT Austin. We will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to Voces. Do you give Voces consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Benson Library? Yes. Do you grant Voces copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes. Do you agree to allow us to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes. We also have questions that uh, you filled out in the pre-interview form that, that have already been filled out and we use that information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure VOSAS server. Before we send it to the Benson, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members, so that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at the Benson? Yes. On occasion, Voces receives requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone number or your email with journalists? Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jose, for bearing with me. I know that that is long, um, but we can, we can get started with just having you um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, so again, I'm Jose Miranda. I'm originally from Nicaragua. I came to this country when I was 11 years old. Uh, I moved to Miami with my mom. My mom had been here since I was one, and she brought a, she brought me and my sister at that time. And I stayed in Miami with her and with my dad. He's not my biological father, but he raised me since I was four. So they, when we moved here, we lived with them. We stayed with them in Miami until I went to UF. At the, uh, went to college at the University of Florida. So I moved to Gainesville. I was there for four years. I got my bachelor's degree. And after that, I actually went back home to Miami uh, to teach. I taught English as a second language in a high school for a couple of years. And then after that, I moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, to work on policy. Uh, I, came, I came to D.C. through a fellowship through the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. And my, the primary reason why I did that was because I've always had an interest in politics and policy and how our government affects the people. Uh, and especially my experience as a teacher showed me that there are a lot of structural and policy challenges to my students' success. So that's what brought me to DC and I've been here since 2016. Uh, I, did, I completed that fellowship. I did a second fellowship on Capitol Hill and after that, I got a job with a member from California, and I recently just left to work for an association that represents community colleges at the federal level. And so in, in your current um, role, how has, um, how has COVID impacted your work in, in your current role, um, especially um, you know, thinking about logistics, but then also just the, the nature of your role, right? Like working, working with community colleges. Yeah, so it's, it's been really interesting. I've been at my job now for about five months and I've spent more time working from home than in my actual office. Uh, I think the national emergency, it wasn't even a month at my new job when the national emergency was declared and then everyone in the office was told that pack up, you're going to work from home. Uh, I think 
the transition maybe because of that was relatively easier for me just because I hadn't gotten used to a specific system and how things got done at the office. So it was like starting a new job except from home. In terms of how it's been different, one, we haven't had the chance. And I think early on there was a, at least an initial plan of, us to tour and see some programs of at least community colleges in the DC metro area or the general area around here. Obviously that was put on hold, that hasn't happened. We've had a couple of conferences that we hold. Um, so we represent governing boards at community trustees. And as part of that, we, we host a lot of different events, a lot of trainings on how to be an effective governing board, an effective trustee. Some of those were canceled. And now going into the fall, they've transitioned to online. We're having a first online one in a couple of weeks. We also have two major national conferences every year, one here in Washington, D.C. in February, which did happen. It happened. It occurred before everything else. Uh, the next one happens in the fall, and it's supposed to take place at the end of September in Chicago this year. That one jumps around in different cities throughout the country from year to year. And it's very likely that that will also be shifted to online, which is a huge challenge for us, both financially, but also in our mission. You know, this is, we, we, the way our association functions is we have committees and we have a governing board made up of trustees that from all over the country and, and oftentimes at this conference is when they have their annual meeting to enact new policies or make updates to how the organization is run. So that's a challenge that we're seeing. How, how are we going to be able to do that? They host elections for the, the various committees and the various boards during this conference. How is that going to look like? It's, it's a whole new world for us in that end. And, and I haven't been there in previous years, so I don't know how much different it is going to be. But just from what I've gathered from my colleagues, it's trying to think and make things happen in a way that were not happening before. Uh, as for my personal like role, my job, so I, I do government relations. My job is very people heavy, people focused. It's a lot of interpersonal skills. And the bulk of my job is going to offices on Capitol Hill, meeting with different members, senators, House of Representatives, and their staff. And we can't do that. Uh, we, it's not that we're not talking anymore. It's just that everything has now transitioned to either a video conference or some offices have security concerns with certain platforms. So you have to do a, a conference call. And it's just different. The way you can, a lot of my work is convincing staff, convincing members on our positions and why community colleges should get the support that they need, especially as we go through a pandemic. And it's significantly harder to do that on an email or on a video conference or a phone call than it is in person. It's, there's just a whole different game to it. And th that's not even to mention the, the technological challenges that may come up. I, I, when I'm talking on the phone, I don't like to sit still, so I'll walk around. But there are certain spots in the house where at any random point of the day, the call will drop. And so that's... Hopefully, luckily, it hasn't happened often when I'm um, on a work call, but it's it's always an issue. And with internet, you never know if you're going to have good enough broadband or if the other person on the other side is going to have good enough broadband. They can hear you well if you're going to freeze. So it's just a whole different set of challenges from that regard. And so thinking about um, your role in, in communicating with staff and, and um, members, you know, what has been that community, like, what has that communication looked like? What, what reactions or um, like, what have you received from folks um, when you try to reach out? It's so it's been a little bit on and off the way Capitol Hill functions is it's very cyclical. There are some times where it's, they're going on into hyperdrive and it's really, really busy and they don't really have time for outside stakeholders. And then there's times when there's 
like the calm of the storm so you have more time but it's it's also an, so so it depends sometimes over the past five months it's been really easy to get a meeting other times it's been a little harder oftentimes it takes uh one two three follow-ups by email because you might be buried the reality is that congressional staff get emails by the hundreds on a daily basis. I was there not that long ago, so I know that, and I have to be aware of that. So there's always the chance that my email is going to get buried, it's going to get lost, and so I have to be uh, consistent and continue following up, checking in. It's also a little harder, and this is when I talk about the job requires a lot of interpersonal skills. The job is based on relationships, and so it's significantly easier for you to get a meeting with someone you already know that knows you that trusts you than it is with a complete stranger and that's been one challenge of COVID right since I changed jobs one of the first things I needed to do was to make the rounds to start introducing myself to different offices who I've worked with in the past in my previous role or who I've never worked with but I now needed to work with so that I could start beginning to establish that relationship and that I never got the chance to do that because as soon as the national emergency happened, there wasn't a chance to do, Hey, I want to do an introductory meeting. First of all, it's kind of weird to just do an introductory meeting by phone. Those are just easier to do in person. But second, we had to immediately start advocating for support for community colleges in any federal stimulus legislation that the house or the Senate were considering. So that, that has been challenging because I think for the most part, I've received positive responses, but I know it would be significantly easier if the person I was sending an email to already knew me and could put a face to the name. Yeah, definitely. That, um, that must be really, really difficult, especially if that's uh, a lot of your job is based in relationships. And so you talked about, um, you were mentioning how you basically had to, you know, get right start, get started advocating because the stimulus package, you know, some of that um, included money to educational institutions. And so could you speak more to that experience? Because I think that, um, you know, especially when thinking about the types of students that community colleges serve, if you can speak more to what that process looked like as you know the the policy was or I guess when they were starting to just initially talk about there being a stimulus and then obviously like it took a while right so yes and no and and so just to put it into context there have been three major landmark bills related to the coronavirus so far there's actually been more but in terms of actions that congress took the first one was additional funding strictly for the federal government. So uh, strengthening uh, health and human services, the Center for Disease Control, and other agencies that were working with them on trying to tackle the virus. The second uh, legislation was, I think it was, uh, I don't recall exactly, but it, oh, I remember. It was the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And that one didn't have education funding per se it was a lot more families and and workforce oriented that's when they strengthened unemployment insurance they added additional funding so that states could have that money uh, the third iteration was the cares act and that's the one where we started seeing funding for education come through but that bill yes it took a long time but it didn't it, it ended up being drafted fairly quickly and it was a very top heavy agreement between senate leadership and house leadership the senate had introduced the first draft and it wasn't something that could get both chambers approvals and within a couple of days they came up with a compromise and then it was passed that was good because they moved quickly and we needed to move quickly and I think as a consensus our association along with a lot of the other national associations that represent different sectors in higher education were happy with it uh, it provided on the text at least a lot of flexibility what happened was 
a couple of things. A, the way the Department of Education then distributed the funds and the different guidelines and guidance that they provided made it very confusing. They kept switching their guidance and their directions felt like every week. And institutions of higher education are very risk averse, particularly when it comes to federal funding. Because if you do something wrong, you run the risk of losing access entirely to the entire federal um, financial aid program which is a lot of money and it's like you mentioned a lot of money that many of students rely on in order to enroll and so nobody wanted to make a mistake nobody wanted to do something that they weren't supposed to do which delayed the time that it took for students to actually get that money and then there was a whole mess about the bill the cares act didn't define what students were eligible that was at least from our interpretation and from many interpret from many groups interpretations and congressional offices like that was a, the prerogative of the institutions but the department of education didn't agree with that and they decided to define who could and who could not access it um, they defined it in a way that was if i'm being completely candid they were they were trying to target undocumented students and doc students but they did it in a way that they left out a lot more students. So they made it so only students who are eligible for Title IV programs. Title IV is the program under the Higher Education Act that fund that, that provides federal financial aid. So only students that were eligible for Title Fund Title IV funds programs could get access to the funds. So in essence, they made it a Title IV program, even though it, that was in its intention. And the issue with that is the only way that that an institution can prove or know that a student is Title IV eligible is if they filled out the FAFSA. There's a ton of students out there, particularly in community colleges, that don't fill out the FAFSA for many reasons. It doesn't have anything to do with their documented status. You have many veterans who don't need it because they're getting GI Bill money, so they don't fill out the FAFSA. You could have different uh, sets of students, especially in community colleges. We have a lot of students who are in workforce programs, who are in non-credit programs, who are in adult education programs, who don't necessarily fill out FAFSA. And so these are people that need the assistance. These are people that are were suffering as a result of the pandemic, yet colleges were not given the green light to get to help them, which that that runs counterproductive to what the cares that was supposed to do. And then the other aspect about it was the way the funding was distributed, it was, uh, it was, they utilized a hybrid formula to determine how much money each institution would get, which relied on 75% was on Pell Grant, the amount of Pell Grant, Pell Grant recipients in an institution, and then 25% was on what is called full-time equivalent. So how many students are enrolled full-time? Two-thirds of community college students are enrolled part-time because they, maybe they have their families, they're working, they're financially independent, you name it. A lot of these people are also folks that suffered from the pandemic because they likely lost their jobs, their kids were now in their house, so they couldn't figure out childcare. Um, there's a lot of sets of challenges with the, the population of, of students that community colleges serve that the bill didn't take into account. And so community colleges ended up getting less money than they probably needed and they probably deserved. So that was another challenge as well. And it's not something that we knew beforehand. The bill was drafted fairly quickly. And it was my job to then, once the bill passed, analyze it, send a, an interpretation to our members and ask the administration was giving updates, releasing or making funds available, providing guidance, providing uh, guidelines. It, it was our job to make sure that our, our members were knew what was happening. But like I said, it felt like every week I was sending an update saying, never mind about what last week, now this is what's happening. So that, I think the, the confusion that the department added and some of the lessons learned from the way that the CARES Act was drafted, which was a very, very quickly, um, have resulted in, in us seeing that there are probably better ways that we could, that the federal government could support our students, particularly community college students.
Well, thank you for, you know, sharing more information about that. I think sometimes we, you know, we see the news headlines and we don't really know what happens on the back end. So I appreciate the really thorough explanation of, of just the, the specific bills that have happened up until this time. And I'm sure, um, I'm sure there will be more at some point, but um, have You're you- You're in the middle of that now. Would you like to speak to that a little bit more? Um, I guess briefly. So uh, like a couple of weeks ago, actually maybe almost a month ago, the House of Representatives passed the HEROES Act, which is their version of what a stimulus for bill would, would be. It provided about $75 billion for education. Um, and it changed the formula to what I was talking. Instead of using full-time equivalent, it uses headcount. So it will count every student that's enrolled, regardless of whether and it will call, count them equally, whether they're part-time or full-time, which is good. And I think we think it's a more equitable way of distributing the funds. Um, but that is not going to pass. It's a democratic marker bill, what we call the marker bill. So this is the Democrats' position, so they can take it into the negotiating table. Um, a couple of weeks ago, after that, the Senate Democrat caucus introduced another bill called the Coronavirus Child Care and Education Response Act, something along those lines. I always forget the exact term. Uh, and it provided significantly more money for education. It also used this new headcount formula uh, and it had a lot of more other, other things, which I, we, think, we think are good. But like I said, that's the Democratic bill. Uh, Leader McConnell is expected to release his version of a stimulus for bill this week, as early as tomorrow. And after that, there's going to be a negotiating and back and forth. Uh, the original timeline was it was expected to be done by the end of this month. It's looking more likely that it's going to go into August just because the two parties are so far apart into what they want to see in the legislation. And for us, it's going to be a push for, A, we need additional funding. Their institutions have had significant financial losses over the spring and the summer. Plus, there's an in incredible amount of increased cost, whether it's in transitioning to e-learning or preparing the campus to reopen safely, what measures you can take, how much more uh, personal protective equipment you need, how much more cleaning practices you need. And so all of that is additional money that institutions don't have right now. And there's also the prospect that states who are, a lot of them are in a budget hole because their tax revenues have dropped are also going to cut state budgets, uh, state higher education budgets. And so it makes it even more crucial that the federal government step in and support. But we don't know what that's going to look like. The that's the reality. But we'll, we'll fight, we'll keep fighting A, to ensure that there is a more equitable formula to distribute this money so that our community colleges have more funds to support those students that have lost jobs, that have children at home that are taking care of them, that are trying to figure out what to do in the middle of this pandemic. But two, just generally speaking, we need a lot more money, not just community colleges, but the entire higher education sector needs a lot more support. And so with you sharing just a lot of the, the challenges that, that you faced, how, how have you felt throughout this entire, you know, process being in this in this new role during this challenging time? And and I guess how have you felt since you know you're you're in the thick of it in DC? How have you felt um, in regards to the way in which this administration has responded? So professionally, it's been fine. I think because of my former role in the house and how, like I said, things are very cyclical, I got used to essentially getting thrown into the fire or flying the plane as I built it. And I think that's how it's felt over the past five months too, especially once the coronavirus hit. Because I was, in my mind, when I switched jobs, I was like thinking, well, this is going to give me the opportunity to just get more, learn more in depth about higher education policies and the current state of the laws and 
what are the proposals to change it and to update it. I haven't had time for that. It was like straight into this is what's happening. This is what we need. We need to make sure that our members know what's happening here in DC and how it's going to affect our institutions. So, but I don't mind that. I guess I guess I got used to that in the house, and and I function well in the in that capacity. So if I need to put out a product, I, I'll I'll get it done. Uh, in a way, it served as a distraction from everything else. Uh, being stuck at home, not being able to go home. I had plans. I had a, a lot of travel plans over the past couple of months that just went by the wayside, and more that are keep getting canceled towards the latter part of the year. And I, I was actually starting to get homesick and I, I was planning to go home. And then Florida, my, my family's still in Florida and I was planning to go home this month actually, just drive down, I have my car here, so drive down so I would be safer and I wouldn't have to take a, an airplane. But then you started seeing the cases in Florida spike at such an exponential rate that I, I was afraid and I think my parents were afraid and they said not to come. So I've had the chance to see my sister and her family twice. Uh, uh, and I think that has helped with the homesickness, but I'm someone that goes home at least once every three weeks, every three months, give or take. So even though I'm in DC, I, I, I'm very close to my family. And so that has been really hard, not, not being able to physically be with them there. And I'm I'm pretty okay, right? I still have a job. Uh, I'm getting paid, and I, I was fortunate enough to have some savings beforehand in case anything happened. My sister's been at home for almost two months now. My mom also got laid off. Then she got called back. Now, it recently, the, the company closed again because there were cases that were present that had happened. People that were working there, so. I think it was also hard being here and not really knowing how to support them or how to like the, the best I could do was like try to get them face masks and ship to them. And I feel like if I was there, I could have, I don't know that I could have done more, but it always feels like you could have been doing more. Uh, so I guess in, the, in that sense there, as for being in DC in the thick of it and how this administration has handled it, how do I put it nicely that this is probably the worst response for a pandemic that we could have possibly imagined? We, to this day, five months after the national emergency, seven months after the first case was first discovered here in the United States, we still don't have a national plan. Every state is doing their own little thing, so it's a whole hodgepodge of different things. And the virus doesn't understand borders. They don't know that, oh, this is Florida and this is Georgia, this is Maryland, this is DC, this is Virginia. And so if there is no uniform plan, there's no consensus, there's no way we're gonna tackle it. And we're gonna see what we keep seeing now where states start to control it and then certain people decide to feel more confident and then they start lit easing off on the gas and it starts spiking and there's flares up, flares up and then you start seeing that kind of like a domino effect. So it's been really frustrating to see the response here. DC government for the most part has been pretty good about the restrictions in place and about, and to their credit for the majority, DC government, Maryland and Virginia have worked closely in trying to provide a somewhat similar approach because they understand that we're in a, in a related like the greater DMV area. So while Virginia has east on restrictions, a lot of northern Virginia still has more restrictions that are a little similar to DC. Same with certain counties in Maryland that are adjacent to DC. So that at least at the state level in some areas has been good, but at the federal level it's just it's been disappointing to think about all the deaths preventable deaths if we had taken the virus seriously from the get-go, if we had taken a unified messaging into ensuring that people do what's best for the community instead of act selfishly. And if we had been strategic, we have 
the, the purchasing power of this country is incredible, right? Yet we're going into July and there, I, I read reports about how we're starting to run short on personal protective equipment again and how ICU beds are filling up again. And these are preventable things. Like we, we sure, we ran out of PPE earlier in the pandemic. We weren't ready. Maybe that could have happened to another administration too. But for that to happen again, for that, for us to not have taken the steps to ensure that that didn't happen again, it's just reckless, in my opinion. And so you talked about um, the the greater DMV area kind of um, doing more, doing more to support in terms of policies and procedures. So, you know. I don't know if you're going out of, of your house to do groceries, but what have you just generally observed when, when you have been out? What have you seen um, folks folks doing? So earlier on, I think people were being a lot more cautious, especially when the city was completely, well, essentially completely shut down. Uh, there were limitations as to how many people could be in the grocery store. Everybody had to have a mask. Uh, actually, the, the nearest grocery store I have, the way they did it was, I, I thought it was really smart, is they would allow one person to go in with a shopping cart. And the way they restricted how many people were in there is they limited the amount of shopping carts. So if there were no shopping carts available when you got in there, you had to wait. And, you know, there's kind of, it felt like it, there was always a line. So you had to be strategic about at what time you were going so that their line would move, would move quicker or there wouldn't be as much of a line. Um, and businesses got hurt for sure, but some got creative, you know, they allowed them to deliver or take like drinks to go or like food to go and, and whatnot. So I think for the most part, people were following guidelines. Now that they've started easing restrictions, like we're, we're on phase two now. So technically we're not that far out from all the other restrictions, but gyms have opened grocery stores don't have capacity restrictions anymore. Um, restaurants can serve you in outside pa outdoor patios as well as indoor. I will say I don't go out a lot. I go out like once a week for my grocery run and like errands that I may need to do. And I put my mask on and I take my car because I don't want to take public transportation right now. And then I come home. I've seen for the most part, and I think this is a trend in the whole country, but I, I just, it feels like people are being a little bit more careless now. You know, I go on social media and I see people at bars or out, out and about, or, or even the gym, like nothing wrong with the gym. I just, I personally not comfortable going back to the gym right now. And so, it's the different levels of risk adversity, but yeah, a lot of people enjoy their summer. You know, you got to do what you got to do, but I, I personally could not do that. Like my birthday was last week and I didn't do anything. And then the way I celebrated was I went to a national park where I knew it was wide and open and hopefully there wouldn't be too many people. And I had my mask on the whole time. And so I just did a small hike and then I came home and that was it because I don't, I don't think I'm going to be going back to a bar maybe for even the rest of this year. And I, I know you had previously mentioned, you know, being, being homesick, um, going back home. I know a lot of people that are from Florida go back home often. And so I think that um, a lot of people are experiencing that. What, what was it like? I don't know if you spend your birthday with your family, but I guess what was it, what did it feel like kind of not being able to um, go home for that? I, so I haven't spent my birthday with my family as often anymore, especially since I've been in DC. And July is usually a very, very busy time on Capitol Hill. And when I was there, so I, I couldn't really take time off but I, I usually spend it with friends. And so that was hard for, you know, my family called me, they FaceTimed me and whatnot. So it's not like I, I felt alone. 
it's just different because I do go every couple of months and I haven't been able to go. And I'm hoping, half hoping that maybe in August I can make that drive and I can see my parents because I haven't seen my parents since February. And you talked about some of the, you previously talked about some of the challenges that your family was, was facing due to COVID and, um, you know, uh, I'm interested in maybe having you share a little bit more about your your mom's challenges because you had mentioned that where she worked they um, they closed but then reopened and then now are, are are closing again and so if you could share more more detail about that yeah so I think so she works at a, like a furniture factory and they first closed around the time when most of all the businesses shut down and, and the, she got called back sometime last month i think they decided to reopen they started bringing some people in they didn't bring everybody back but they brought i think the majority of the people they had projects that were running but then the projects kind of started running out because in this economy nobody's placing furniture orders and so the, the owners, though, to their credit, they were still trying to keep the employees there for as long as they could hold out. Um, but then there were two or three people that ended up going to the hospital because they got coronavirus. And so the the owners tried to get um, someone to to test everyone uh, in, in, the, in the facility, and that didn't work out. So then they ended up at the, rather than continue risking exposure to the rest of their employees, they decided we're going to shut down. We don't have that much work anyway. Um, we'll call you back when, when things have settled, uh, but you won't be allowed to come back un unless you show us proof that you tested yourself and you came back negative. Uh, luckily, my mom, she has she's gotten tested a couple of times now, uh, and they've all come back negative. So same with my dad. So blessed in that regard. Uh, but it, it's been hard because she, <laughs> and then when she was first unemployed, she applied for, you know, unemployment benefits and <laughs> she got called back to work and she still hadn't received this. The, the, she received the federal level ones, the $600 that were passed with, in the CARES Act. She received that a couple of times, but the, the one she's entitled to from the state, uh, and this is something that I probably read about the the Florida unemployment system is a complete mess it's completely outdated and it doesn't really help that the administration in Florida has not prioritized it she she got called back to work and she hadn't even received a single check from or she received one and not any of the other ones that she was entitled to so now she's back off work and she's gonna have to start that whole system again and and try to get their her money which who knows if she's even going to get it or when she'll get it. So that's been frustrating in that regard. And has, um, has that experience for her, has that particularly impacted you or, or your family, you know, financially or impacted your ability to um, do certain things? Like I know some states have, done like you know uh, a moratorium on, on evictions and so that I know has helped some folks but uh, yeah how how has has your family been been impacted luckily no like I said she did get the federal um, assistance with the $600 of unemployment so that helped her pay the rent and I did tell her you know if something happens just let me know because I do have savings and I have a job so I, I can help them it hasn't come to that yet. I think I helped her the first month with a little bit of money, like that window between when she got laid off and when she first got some of that assistance from the federal government. Um, but it's been manageable so far. It's just, it's a question whether how long, how sustainable that is if the state unemployment system of Florida continues being what it is. And who knows when she's going to get called back again. And it's like, I, I don't know, right? Like, personally, I'm okay if she doesn't get called back because that means she's less exposed. But I know for her, she doesn't want that because then she's going to have to stress about money. 
she would rather be working. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's, um, I'm sure that's very difficult for her. Um, and then what was she doing? I don't know if any, in, if in your communication with her, you know, what was she doing when, you know, she was unemployed? Was she just home? Um, you know, was she trying to do other things? She was home. So for context and to make things worse, my dad was hospitalized earlier this year and he that's actually the last time I saw them when I went down to see him in February and he was discharged before the pandemic hit us really bad so he's been home but he was discharged but he wasn't okay so he's still been recovering he's still in recovery mode actually and so my mom was just home taking care of him and helping him for the most part and before my sister and my brother-in-law got laid off my my parents are the ones to take care of the kids whenever they're working so when they were working the kids were with them as well and so when when your mom was working and and maybe also taking care of the the kids when she wasn't was there anything specific that um she did like procedure wise or like routine to just ensure um you know your dad had had been a minimal exposure exposure during this recovery period she didn't let him out of the house once <laughs> like not even to like the front porch and i told her like he needs fresh air that's fine as long as he's like has a distance from other people but she was very very cautious he's like no he's not leaving the house if he wants to walk he can walk in the living room so that was funny and probably a little too much but especially that early month those like early months of March and April when like, he's now fine but then he could he couldn't even be outside of like the bed for too long so she was cleaning everything she was making sure he stayed clean all the stuff around him were clean um, he couldn't eat solids so she had to make sure that he, she, she had like soft foods or liquids that he could be that he could actually eat um, and I think that was a lot of her time that's how she spent a lot of her time and you talked about um your your sister and and your um brother-in-law also um losing losing their job due to the pandemic or being furloughed um but uh, how how has that been for them? You know, what was the experience like for them? And then um, you talked about how um, the the toll that that might have taken on the entire family with your mom also having to babysit. So if you could speak more to that as well. Yeah, and so for them, they both work at the airport. They work at um, MIA. She works for a, a company, she's a cleaner, so a company that gets contracted by airlines to clean the airplanes. Uh, he works for a subsidiary of American Airlines and their customer service um, department. And so she's been furloughed this whole time, which I, again, like I was okay with it because they were working at an airport, which is a high exposure area. And I was like, honestly, maybe it's a good thing you're not there. Um, but he got called back, so he's been back to work, uh, just, which is scary. But luckily for them, the same thing where, you know, I told them, like, if you all need help with the bills or the rent, just let me know. Uh, it hasn't come to that. They, they, they were able to get their, their unemployment benefits fairly quickly, uh, which, again, goes to show that the whole system is a mess because some get processed real quick, others get lost entirely um but it's been fine my my brother lost back to work now the, the my mom my sister is not so she's been staying with the kids this whole time and she it was a i think it was a learning curve for her because not only did she have to stay with them but then they had to transition to e-learning so she had to figure out how to do that uh, and to make sure that they were there the time they needed to be there um and my my nephew was doing summer classes too online. So going through that, uh, I will say she has spent more of her time cooking. She's cooking a lot more now than she was when she was working and making all these different kinds of recipes and like Nicaraguan dishes and 
things that she finds online. So that's been nice, at least for her and for the kids. Like they're eating different kinds of things. Uh, and with at least with my brother-in-law, you know, they're required to have a mask and everything. Um, and there's been some cases at the airport reported, but luckily it hasn't been anyone as far as I know that he's been in close contact with. So he's been fine. My sister worked as a cleaner, so I was more concerned with her because she's in the thick of it. You know, when when you look at the amount of um, of how Latinos and Black people are disproportionately affected by this pandemic, it's greatly as a result of being essential workers and being required to be in places and in positions that expose them at greater rates. And so that was one of my, that was my sister. Uh, so I am glad that she's still furloughed. I know it's probably taken a toll on their finances, but between her, like between some of the unemployment benefits that she's gotten and brother-in-law salary, they at least managed to pay the bill and the rent. Yeah, I can I can see how you might be relieved uh, given given the circumstances, especially at an airport. Um, and you bring up uh, an interesting point on top of everything going on, like you know, with with work um, instruction for for K twelve definitely shifted. And so how how was that experience like? And you know, have have you all had conversations about what the fall will look like um, for them in, in Florida schools? Like, is she, is, are they gonna go back? Um, are they gonna do online instruction? So they don't know yet. Um, <laughs> earlier on, like back in June, my sister was telling me how the county, Miami-Dade County Public Schools had sent out a parent survey asking if they preferred their children to go back to schools or like to stay online for the fall and she told me that she had answered like yes send them back because I can't do this like I don't know what I'm doing they're not learning um and part of it is is a legitimate you know it's it's a legitimate feeling from a lot of parents especially if you're a parent who has to still work from home but you have to take care of your children at the same time uh, but then you saw everything spiking. And I guess her, my, my nephew's in middle school, my niece is in elementary school. Oh, my niece's school reached out to them asking, essentially, I guess now parents have an option in Miami-Dade. They can choose to um, have their kids continue with e-learning. And she said that she would much rather my niece stay home. She's like, you know, she might be behind, but I'd rather she be behind than, than she be exposed because she can always catch up, which is true. And, you know, if we get her the proper tools, the proper resources down the road, she's a bright kid. So she'll make inroads. But I think there was a legitimate concern for my, my, my sister that, yeah, it's, it's a lot on her and it's a lot on the kids to try to learn on like a computer, but it's much safer than sending them back to school. I don't know what's happening with my nephew. I don't think the school has communicated directly with them yet on whether they have options or, or what it's going to look like. And uh, aside from, um, you know, academically, have you seen this, this switch to online instruction impacting them in any other way? You know, I don't... I don't know. I wouldn't be able to tell you because I don't see them every day. And so the two times that I saw them, they were their same old selves. My nephew is, likes to play video games. So he when he wasn't on the computer taking classes, he was on the computer playing Minecraft. So, uh, and then he would join us and like we would watch TV or do whatever. But I think they're fine for the most part as of now. I think they've also grown up in a more digital age where it feels more normal to be communicating online electronically than, than how we grew up, you know, like playing in someone's backyard or the playground after school or whatever. So.
and uh, I don't know if your sister shared anything with you as to, you know, how um, how their schools were, were supporting students during this time. Because um, I know some schools in, in Miami were, you know, giving out lunches or supporting with um, with any technology needs that they might have. So is that something that was communicated to them? Yeah. So I think my nephew missed that last school day uh, before they were officially sent home because my parents, my, my sister, her par his parents were already like getting scared. Uh, my niece did go and so my niece they, they give her a computer so she, which is good because my my sister they only had one laptop at home so with my nephew using that one my niece needed something to do her work too so so she has a computer from the district that she's been using i think lunch was available for them to pick up but i don't remember if they ultimately got it if they ultimately like, went to pick it up because they also received part of the CARES Act was included uh, additional funding for SNAP, particularly for families who had children that were in public schools who were no longer going to be getting their free or reduced lunch. So if you had free or reduced lunch, I think you got a, a, a supplement SNAP sent to you. And I think they did receive that at least uh, for a couple of months. And so I, um, I want to be respectful of your time with me today. So um, I just have one, one last uh, question. If, if there, is there anything else you would like to share with me um, today about your experiences with COVID-19 that I've not asked about yet? Yeah, um, well, one, just this whole year in general, because like I said earlier, I don't go out and I, that's true. The only exception to that is when there were protests after the murder of George Floyd. And so I participated in those. I was near the White House. I was actually um, at the White House at the site of the church one day after the news, like that Monday when the administration forcefully cleared out protesters just so the president could have a little photo up. Um, I think that was the turning point for me and for a lot of people here in the city where I was planning to go anyway, but I was planning to go in the, during the weekends only. I had gone the Saturday prior to protest and I was planning to go the following weekend. But I saw that Monday night and I was like, this is, this is unacceptable. So a lot of us went out that Tuesday. But I will say, and I think there's research to prove this, like, surprisingly there's hasn't been a huge spike resulting from a lot of the black lives matter protests across the nation particularly in dc though and i think it has a lot to do with the kind of people that are there people that are there are those that that are very community oriented it's obvious, it's why they're there to begin with um and so even though it's really hard to do six feet apart and social distance in those kind of settings I cannot recall a single person who didn't have a face mask on. And when we had, we had marches that following weekend, and we're talking about thousands and thousands of people marching throughout different parts of the city. There were volunteer stations with people that had hand sanitizer, extra face masks, water, snacks, different things that you would need to make sure that you were protesting and exercising your constitutional rights, but in a very safe manner, not just to you, but to those around you as well. And I wish, you know, if, if more people had that mindset, maybe you were inconvenienced because you don't like the face mask or yeah, it sucks to be stuck at home, but it sucks to even more to know that there are people you may know or you yourself may end up in the hospital and so I, I feel like if, if people had a, a closer mindset to the mindset that a lot of us had when we went out to those protests, it was like, we want to speak out against injustice, but we also want to make sure that we don't put anybody else at risk. So we're going to be extra cautious. If more people did that, we wouldn't be in the situation where we are right now.
even with the disaster, disastrous response that this administration has provided to COVID. I just wanted to ask ask a, a follow up, um, especially since you spent a lot of time talking about the protests um, and you shared observations. Uh, can you share any additional observations from your time physically going to the protests? Because I know, as you mentioned, right, there's there's been um, a lot of information shared that you know may or may not be true. And so, if you could. Um, just share additional information aside from what you've already shared about what you've observed. Um, yeah, so I guess a couple more things is you, you saw uh, the news covered a lot how early on the protests turned violent, this happened and that happened, and I'm not going to justify one thing or another. I think anger is rightly justified in some situations and after you spend so many years asking for black people to be treated like human beings by police officers and being ignored some of that anger may, may spill over but the other thing that I saw honestly at least in DC was that nothing happened unless the police or the military because there was one point where DC felt like it was a, another country with a military occupation. Uh, roads were blocked off, every block had a, a Humvee, and like people from different federal agencies, law enforcement agencies. Uh, so it was, it felt like a war zone, but nothing happened until protesters were instigated oftentimes, and, and, and things didn't erupt until like late in the night. So at that point, you know, it's maybe not the protesters who've been there since like, 2 p.m. It's maybe some people that came intentionally to try to incite violence and and this this I don't know. But from what I saw, at least from my personal observation, was the protests were peaceful. Everything sometimes tensions flared up, but nothing actually turned violent until protesters felt like they were being attacked. Thank you for sharing more information about that. Um, and just one last, uh, is there anything else that you wanna share before, um, before we end the interview? I guess the only thing I would say is that I'm, I am fortunate that I still have a job and a job that is very understanding and has allowed me to take all the um, caution that I need to be safe. But like I said, a lot of people in our community unfortunately don't have that luxury. And a lot of people have to report to their job because they're essential workers or because if they don't, then they're going to be evicted or they're going to lose their utilities and whatnot. And some people don't have an option in being outside. Others do. And I wish the people that do were more mindful of the people that don't because that way we could have less people exposed and less people dying and less people in hospitals, particularly when you think about how it's affecting a lot of low-income families, a lot of Latino families, a lot of Black folks. It's about thinking for a little bit beyond just yourself and try to think of your community and others around you. Well, thank you, Jose, so much for taking the time to talk with me today and share your experiences and stories and thoughts and feelings. Um, and I really appreciate your perspective. Thank you very much. <laughs>